I am Beata Madari, a research scientist of the Brazilian Agricultural Corporation, Embrapa, and I'm also a member of the Scientific and Technical Committee of the initiative. I coordinate this webinar together with my colleague Alejandro Puentes from Chile, who is head of Viticulture Unit of the International Organization of Vine and Wine and is also a member of the Scientific Committee. The Four Poor Meal Initiative recognizes the effective so that effective solutions to transition towards a productive, highly resilient, and sustainable agriculture are regional, considering the biophysical, social, economic, and political peculiarities of each region. Thus, uh, we would like to place great efforts to initiate regional dialogues in the topic. In this first webinar, specifically held for the, for the Latin America and the Caribbean region, we would like to introduce the initiative better to all of you and also to learn what are the interests and concerns in this region in specific issues within the context of soil carbon sequestration and sustainable agriculture. <clears throat> After this webinar, we intend to organize others focusing on selected topics of interest for the region and its subregions. So we encourage all to please raise questions about the initiative and express your interest in specific issues. Uh, to do that, please, you can use the chat or the question and answers, um, sending messages to all. Uh, also to ask questions to the speakers or make comments. Uh, but we cannot, for lack of time, respond immediately. We will try to respond in writing after the webinar. And uh, the speakers may, may also try to respond uh, in the chat or the question and answers uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of, of the screen. And now um, I would like to give the, the word to my colleague Alejandro to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much, Beata. Thank you, everyone, to, to be here for this important initiative. Um, first, of, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, our first presentation. It's uh, Mr. Paulou. Uh, Mr. Paulou is uh, Secretary Executive of uh, Initiative Card uh, for for thousands. Um, Paul, it's a uh, in agronomy it's a specialist in tropical agronomy with uh, important collaborations and important experience in uh, uh, at level international. It, it's in different areas of, uh, for example, uh, Caribbean, uh, um, overseas, etc. Uh, Paul, please, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to introduce you. You, 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 got the, uh, you have the floor uh, for to present the initiative, the history and objective of uh, this important initiative. Thank you very much, Alejandro, and thank you, Beata, for inviting us to that, uh, that webinar. I will uh, share my screen, if I may, in order to start my presentation. I hope that you can see my screen. Hopefully, this is the case. So, um, I would like to start my presentation first uh, by just a general consideration. We, we know that we are in a, quite a bad situation on Earth, on our planet, and we have only one planet. And we know that there are two main problems that uh, we are facing at the moment. The, the first one is to fight climate change. I'm not talking about the COVID, of course, this is one of the main ones at the moment. But, just talking about the general one that we had before the COVID crisis, it was to fight and it's still to fight climate change, uh, food insecurity and uh, biodiversity uh, losses. So we know that one of the first thing we can do is to start conserve the conservation, increase the conservation of remaining natural habitat. That could be the natural sensitive area rich uh, with uh, carbon rich soil that are in in uh, dark green on the first map on my slide, or it could be the biodiversity hotspot that we have all over the world. The second 
possibility that we have is to start restoring the ecosystem and we can choose among all those areas that were uh, degraded by um, human activity, we can prioritize which area is globally interesting to protect in those ecosystem restoration. And we know through a scientific study that if we can find the restore the 15%, the most important converted land in priority in the world, we could avoid 60% of the expected extinction of biodiversity while sequestering 300 gigaton of carbon. That means 30% of the total CO2 that increased in the atmosphere since the industrial revolution. So that could be a very interesting way. But for that, we need also to concentrate on the most important agricultural land. And at the same time, we need to change practice in all agricultural area in priority area with a high potential in soil carbon sequestration using agroecology. And this could be in the area that we know that have the more potential to sequester carbon in the world. Well, there are different study, different maps, but this is one of those maps. So most of the time I insist on the fact that why is it so important to store carbon in soil? I think most of you know the answer, but I will try to, to be uh, flexible. And uh, I would say that for those who do not know, we, we need first to store climate um, carbon in soil in order to mitigate climate change, because we know that this will pump the CO2 from the atmosphere through the, the very low cost negative emission technology, which is the photosynthesis, photosynthesis, and the plant will capture the carbon and then put in the soil through the, the roots and when they will be, um, they will be dead. But the second importance of this is to adapt climate change because agriculture uh, need to need water also to be developed. And we know that when we increase soil organic matter in soil, it increases the capacity of water retention. And it also increases the, 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 the capacity of resilience to erosion of those soil. So the last point is the most obvious is that when you increase the quantity of organic matter in soil, you, are, you increase also the fertility. And so you increase the yield, but you also increase the stability of the yield and you help restoring degraded land. So if you look at the, just a figure where this funny name of four per mil initiative is coming from, it just come from the back of the envelope calculation, comparing the quantity of carbon already present in the soil all over the world and the quantity of carbon released in the atmosphere every year due to the human activity. And when you compare both, the calculation was simple. What, are the what is the percentage of increase we need to have in the soil every year in order to try to offset all the, the carbon that we are releasing in the atmosphere every year? And the calculation come to 0.4%, which is in French, four per mille, uh, quatre pour mille, and this is the name of the initiative. But this is just a theoretical calculation it just shows us the direction we have to follow. And in 2015 in Paris, at the COP21, the, the 4 per mil initiative, Soil for Food Security and Climate, was born uh, with 160 uh, parents, I would say, first signatory. And uh, it's articulated in two parts, an action plan with a multi-stakeholder platform, a tools to expertise and evaluate project, and a scientific program that push also research uh, to, to develop in, this, in the, the field of soil organic carbon. And you will know more about that in, in the future presentation. So the goal of the initiative, as you already uh, know, is that we promote the carbon sequestration in soil as organic matter to increase food security, to adapt agriculture to climate change and to mitigate, to contribute to the mitigation to climate change. All of that, uh, and uh, of course, the, the SDGs of the United Nations. And among all those SDG, we addressed mainly directly three of them, the number two, number 15, and number 13. We address indirectly two of two other, number six and number 12, and directly also the number 17, which is the global cooperation. We are working in respect of human right, of land tenure, and the welfare well-being. Today, uh, the For Permit Initiative count 565, we started by 160, as I told you before, signatory of the Paris Declaration. It means 
partners of the initiative, among which almost half of them are uh, members of this uh, initiative. It means that they contribute to the decision-making process. Our chair is Mr. Stéphane Le Foll, ex-minister of agriculture in France, and the vice chair is now Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki, executive secretary of Nepal. You have a small sketch about the, the organization of the initiative with a forum of partners, the consortium member, and the scientific and technical committee that uh, Alejandro, Beata, Claire belong to, and uh, the executive secretariat that I have the honor and the pleasure to, to manage that tried to make all of this working, I hope, efficiently. So just a map to show you some of our members, partners, uh, countries, and uh, organization. And this is another way to have all those members on the world. And you can see that they are everywhere on the, on the planet. The scientific and technical committee is composed by 14 members, uh, scientists. So you recognize the name of Claire Chenu, Alejandro Fuentes, Beata Madari. Uh, they are among those 14 persons. And those persons have various competencies and have also um, they are originally from different parts of the world. It means that the scientific and technical committee is really international, is multi-competency, and it's half men and half women. That means that we, we try to balance all the aspects and they are also uh, very strong in scientific knowledge. So since the beginning of the uh, initiative, on the scientific part, uh, we concentrate uh, the work of the scientific and technical committee on various activities. Uh, it was mainly working also on the on the set of indicator and criteria that we'll present to you shortly uh, after. They work, they contribute to the scientific oriented cooperation network with CIRCASA, with ITPS, with uh, Coroniva John Work, and all those uh, big uh, fora that are working with soil carbon sequestration. And um, well, they contribute also to develop uh, all the scientific part of our website. Here is a, just a picture to show you what are the, the set of referenced criteria for assessment of projects that, were, that was developed by the STC, Scientific and Technical Committee. And you can see that we have indicator and criteria uh, from soil carbon and land conservation or restoration, food security, of course, mitigation, adaptation, the three main objective of the, the initiative, but also the safeguard what is concerning the, the, the land right and the human right and so that we need to respect in all the projects. They also provide, but this is, this is very symbolic of course there, but uh, it's more developed on our website, develop the, the four pillars that need to be um, implemented in the international research and scientific cooperation program that you will have more time if you want to read them. Uh, I will let you my presentation. In the activity uh, in the field, uh, we had several work, mainly the, the mobilization of all categories of stakeholder and animation within the, the five college that we have in that, um, in that initiative. And we developed the collaborative platform, which is a tool for collaboration between all the members and partners. We developed the website and we are present on the social network. We increased the general awareness of importance of soil uh, and uh, soil organic carbon. Uh, we developed the strategic plan of the initiative. I will come to that very quickly soon. And uh, we had a call for project for assessment based on the set of indicator and criteria prepared by the STC. And we, we had a call of, for project last year and this year, and we received more than uh, 30 projects that were assessed by the STC. Um, well, we have also some uh, institutional meeting and we, we have a relation with, we, we, most of the time we have our main meeting during the COPs in order for, for the people who participate to the COP to be present also without traveling again, try to save some carbon in the atmosphere. And we had also some regional meeting. We hope to organize, uh, as Beata will tell you some soon, uh, a meeting next year in Latin America. Well, the problem we have, we are facing, the farmers are facing is that, of course, we know that there is some limit and feasibility to the practice and it depends. We know most of the practice that will help to develop carbon sequestration in soil, but we need to uh, be to consider that it depends on the climate, on the soil, on the biomass availability, the nutrients, the water, and so on. 
Um, I will not be long on that because you all know that, but we know that um, since we start working in agriculture, uh, the human beings, we start degrading the soil. That was from the very early stage. And um, now what we try to do, is because we know that we are doing something not very good, we try to reach this new equilibrium and um, to up to stop the erosion of the soil. But what we know we need to know now is also to increase the quantity of carbon in the soil and come back to the, the, the pink part, even the, the green and the yellow part if we can, the green at least to try to bring back the soil to the status that he had before concerning soil organic carbon. So we know that we have several techniques that could be used that could be or increase carbon inputs or try to decrease carbon losses or to reduce disturbance. All of those are mentioned is that in that uh, table. When you ask question to the farmers, what are the farmers, what are the options that you can use to manage better your soil organic carbon? The farmers know that they can use some practice that are concerning crops or livestock or even agroforestry in order to reach that result. And if you consider at the level of our society altogether, our society would like all the farmers to use less agrochemical and less mineral fertilizer while increasing biodiversity again and increasing soil organic carbon. Today, with the conventional agriculture, we are roughly here. But we need to get inspiration in the natural forestry ecosystem. And for that, we need to go to use agroecology as, as a wall. Fortunately, agroecology is only one practice. It, it's a different categories of agriculture that help us to be more and more complex, to be more and more complete, increasing the use of the trees, the use of the animals, the use of the nautilage, direct sowing, uh, rotation, cover crops. Um, and so we know that we can go along that agroecology evolution in order to try to find which agriculture suits the best to the, the condition that we have. It's, it depends on the choice of the farmers, of course. This is an example of what could be an agroforestry system, a complex one in tropical condition, where all species are useful and planted by the farmers. So that's ultimate. I, don't, I never said that all the system can be transformed in agroforestry system. This is just an example of the result we can achieve. We used to place, to place the farmers at the center of the initiative because they are the ones who are interacting with all the other stakeholders of the society. And they receive pressure from those stakeholders, but they also provide our products or uh, provide waiting, expecting some uh, return from the, the, those different various stakeholders. And one of the things that is a major demand from the farmers is how they can get access some time to better knowledge of practice and better support. Well, when you ask this, the question to the farmers themselves, telling what in your view can help you to increase adoption of soil carbon sequestration practice, they said clearly that they need information advice first and secondly support, that means economic support. So that is why we have developed in the four per mean initiative, the strategic plan, which is guided by our vision that in 2050, we will have a worldwide healthy and carbon rich soil to combat climate change and end hunger. This strategic plan is organized using guiding principle. The soil health is at the center of the action. Farmers and foresters are key actor and at the center. They are, we have a science-based and result-oriented approach. We, we, have, uh, we are a multi-stakeholder approach and a multi a public private cooperation that promote mutual support between actors, open access and open data, and optimal allocation of resources, including farmers and foresters. You will have time to read that more in detail. And this strategic plan is on our website. It is organized in six goals, six main goals. Each of them included objectives. And the objective is designed with a description, a baseline, the present status, and the target in 2030 and 2050. Here is are all the objective organized in the six goals. So implementation, uh, inception and conceptualization, implementation, promotion, collaboration, 
uh, follow up and in the middle cross cutting action. So here is our strategic plan. We are working on the task force at the moment. If you want to join and be part of it, you can contact us and we'll try to, to find you a place, a room, but this is important that you participate to that work. It will, um, it will lead to uh, an action and activity plan in the future for the initiative, in addition to all what we already did. So here's the end of my presentation. I hope that I give you a taste of what we, we are doing, where we're we coming from, and I let the, the floor to, to all the other speakers that will give you more detail about how important it is to go in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, very much for, for this presentation. Uh, Beata, if you want to introduce your, our next uh, guest, Cornelia. Uh, yes. Thank you, Beata. Okay, so uh, uh, you all will have uh, some more time, some uh, opportunity at the end to ask questions to Paul. Uh, but now we continue with the presentation uh, from Cornelia. Cornelia Rumpel is a research scientist at the Institute of Ecology and Environment of the French National Research Center in Paris. In Paris. She is currently the chair of the Scientific and Technical Committee of the Four Formula Initiative. Cornelia, it's with you, please. Okay. Thank you, Beata. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my presentation. Um, it's okay. Can you see? Not, not oh, yet. Not yet. No. Uh, wait, 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 wait. No. That is yeah. working. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to give uh, this presentation about the objectives and the activities of the STC of the Four Per Mill Initiative. So we are 14 members and I'm speaking on behalf of them uh, um, because as Beata said, I uh, uh, was appointed chair for another year. And so concerning uh, uh, the role of the initiative is in the four per minute uh, uh, initiative, uh, uh, its role is to facilitate the interaction between policy science and uh, practitioners globally. Um, as Paul already told you, uh, we have uh, uh, three bodies, the Forum of Partners, the uh, Consortium of Members, and the Scientific and Technical Committee, and the Executive uh, Secretariat, uh, which is, um, who is um, uh, uh, making the link between the, dif uh, the, the different bodies, so the Consortium Members consortium of members is the decision making body it's responsible for the budget the policy and the work program and uh, the scientific committee with its uh, 14 members uh, which are who are appointed for two years uh, renewable the scientific uh, committee is um, uh, uh, is, is, is was appointed because uh, the members they are recognized for their scientific and technical competence and as Paul already said they are representative from all regions of the world and we have a gender balance and uh, uh, its main task is um, to give advice so the SCC has a central role for setting the scene for the implementation of uh, carbon sequestration strategies within uh, the initiative. And the advice is given mainly to the consortium uh, who have to take uh, the decisions. So the main task of the SDC uh, are to propose a set of uh, criteria for the evaluation of projects and actions under uh, the framework of the initiative. We uh, were supposed to define the research program and to formulate uh, needs for research and cooperation. We formulate advice on projects, actions, and programs, for example, the vision, mission, and strategic plan for implementation, uh, which uh, uh, Paul talked uh, about. And we give a scientifically founded views about the importance of soil carbon sequestration for addressing sustainable development goals. And uh, last uh, but not least, we also contribute to the outreach of the initiative through participation and organization of events. So uh, the objectives of uh, this talk is uh, to present you uh, with the initial ambition of the initiative and how it corresponded to scientific reality. 
Also, I would like to show how the STC helped to shape the message of the initiative and to show actions of the STC to promote soil carbon sequestration through science policy practice interactions. So, um, uh, the implementation um, uh, of the uh, SDGs as, uh, as aspirational goals uh, by national governments uh, were based on the de definition of those goals uh, by the United Nations. So the, you know they defined in 2015-17 sustainable development goals, and the national governments they have now to uh, to address these goals. And so um, one of the solutions that were suggested uh, by the French government was uh, that uh, increasing soil carbon storage could uh, help to address uh, some of these uh, SDGs. And uh, this, uh, in particular, uh, the SDC, uh, uh, SDG 13 about the climate. So uh, it was proposed that increasing soil carbon storage, as uh, Paul um, told us, uh, could um, uh, help to mitigate and to adapt to climate change. And uh, therefore, um, uh, it was seen as a negative emission technology uh, in view of climate change mitigation and uh, could also contribute to sustainable intensification of agriculture. And this uh, has had really strong uh, political appeal. And uh, uh, however, everybody was talking about four per mil uh, suddenly, but uh, in the scientific community, there, were, um, there, there was a very uh, controversial discussion about the fe feasibility of uh, the strategy. So uh, the initial uh, framework uh, was uh, based on a, just on a thought experiment that we have the uh, 8.9 gigatons carbon as annual global emissions from fossil fuels. And uh, we know also that uh, globally soils uh, store about 2,400 gigatons of carbon. And we, when we just divide these numbers, as Paul told us, then we uh, have the number four per mil. And we need to increase every year the global soil carbon stocks by just four per mil. Um, and we could account for or, or the, uh, yeah, counterbalance all these fossil fuel emissions. As this was published in the scientific literature. And it was, uh, this number was picked up by a politician because uh, it's uh, one number easy to communicate. And uh, 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 this is uh, politicians like this, it's easy to understand and uh, might have a big uh, impact to this, such a small number. And this is similar to the, the to increase the soil carbon by four per mil every year is similar to the political goal of uh, limiting the warming to two, uh, 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 two degrees centigrade. So this is not really the feasibility is not really shown, it's just the aspirational goal. And due to this uh, easy number, easy to communicate, the initiative gained uh, importance because the policy makers were very interested uh, uh, in its feasibility. And uh, th this four per mil was wrongly understood as a target, a goal and a strong commitment. Uh, and the initial criticism of the scientists were mainly related um, to the suggestion that this could offset all of the fuel emissions. And um, therefore, there was uh, several criticisms of this for, for mill initiative. There was a biophysical uh, criticism. People said, yeah, the carbon in the soil is non-permanent. That is a problem. Ca soil has a limited mm -hmm. storage Cornelia. capacity. And also we need uh, biomass and nutrients in order to store carbon. But this criticism was mainly related to the number and the mitigation function of uh, soil organic carbon sequestration. So there were socioeconomic criticism. Cornelia. Yeah. Cornelia, can you hear me? Can you switch to the full screen? Because we see your in presentation mode for you. Are you, are you the possibility? To um, I see as a, as a presentation mode. Can you see now? No, no. We, oh. we see we see uh, the the next slide and the and the time and so on. Mm. Well, that's okay. That's okay. If not, it's okay. Wait. Sorry for that. No, I don't know. Then I, I. That's okay. Continue like that. No worry. Share, share your screen again. OK, 
Can you see? Okay. Yes, yes, it's okay. It's okay, continue like that. Oh, it is, uh, also I see in presentation mode, it's really bizarre, huh? So, um, uh, yeah, then I should maybe, uh, no. Okay, when I have it, so so there was the socio-economical criticisms and the, uh, that the farmers might not adopt. So we have to demonstrate the the benefits of the soil carbon sequestration, and also to develop policies um, for for its uh, adoption. And there was a political criticism that uh, this this could be used to, uh, as an excuse not to change our lifestyles and not to reduce. Uh, the emissions and this could be, uh, it was even said that this could be a credibility issue for soil science. And so we, we need to, to uh, as a solution, we need to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to indicate that uh, because of all these global challenges, we really need every contribution to fight uh, climate change and that uh, soil organic carbon sequestration, although it might not uh, be able to uh, counterbalance all these fossil fuel emission, it can make uh, um, a significant contribution. So how to move forward? We, the SDC uh, worked a lot on reconciling uh, these policy uh, needs with the practical reality. So uh, in general, there is a consensus that increasing soil organic carbon is beneficial due to its co-benefits, but that in terms of climate change mitigation, the achievable potential is limited to one gigaton organic carbon per year, which is uh, not, uh, which are not all of the emissions, but uh, however, this is an important contribution because uh, these emissions are equivalent to the emissions from one big emitter as for example, the European Union. And so uh, we need a new definition of the four per mil goals Four per mil has to be seen as uh, an aspirational goal and not uh, a normative one. So it may be achievable local, locally, but not uh, everywhere. It has uh, costs in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, water, and biomass. And there are also risks that may be associated to soil organic carbon sequestration in terms of greenhouse gas, uh, other greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, land use. And uh, it's what one important thing is that we need to maintain and to increase soil carbon stocks. And the concept is uh, much more important than the number and for per mill is an order of magnitude for reference and maybe achievable at the local scale and maybe not everywhere. So um, we have to acknowledge the limitations and, uh, uh, and uh, however, there are many uh, possibilities for improving nutrient and organic uh, residue management at farm region and national scales, we could be exploited to maintain and if possibly increase uh, soil organic carbon stacks and to improve uh, soil quality. So we need a spatially diversified strategy and trade-offs such as uh, greenhouse gas emissions other than CO2 and water use have to be considered and to be accounted for. So the actions, uh, the SCC actions to promote region-specific for per mill strategies uh, is the organization of a special issue uh, on region-specific sustainable agricultural practices to increase soil uh, carbon sequestration. So we, ha uh, we have uh, contributing authors from, the, uh, all, uh, from all over the world, from the different regions of the world. And the special issue will be published in the Journal um, of en uh, Regional Environmental Change. Um, and it uh, will highlight the potential for specific actions to be taken to increase uh, soil organic carbon storage. We also um, participated and organized uh, in regional multi-stakeholder workshops, like the one that we are holding uh, uh, right now, uh, as it's one of the beginning uh, in, in, in Latin America. We will have another one next year. Um, we had a Southeast Asia workshop in Hanoi, and there will also be an Asia regional meeting. And these workshops uh, are uh, organized to facilitate the communication and interaction of multiple stakeholders and also to attract funders. Um, um, in, in terms of the action, setting the scene for ameliorating organic carbon management, we established guidelines for success. So this means we defined the rules of the games 
we um, developed criteria and indicators to evaluate solar organic carbon sequestration projects. And uh, we would like to mainstream these criteria into existing assessment schemes. The criteria, uh, this um, work was published and is available on our webpage. Uh, and uh, we also would like to launch a call for projects um, to, uh, to and give a prize for the most uh, promising projects. These projects will be assessed by the STC with uh, the criteria which we developed. And um, such actions uh, sh sh uh, should uh, promote excellence for permit projects and also identify success stories. In terms of the project assessment, so what are projects that are specific action under defined temporal and spatial scales and ecosystems? Um, the, in these projects that should target retention or increase of soil carbon, and they are related to man land management and or land use options, and there are benefits and trade-offs uh, for local communities. So why do we need to assess? Uh, we, should, uh, we assess uh, the project if it is consistent with the aims of the initiative. And this um, uh, assessment uh, is done ex ante and is, uh, its objective, objective is to give ex ante advice for the amelioration of the slum sequestration projects using these reference criteria and indicators that uh, we developed. The assessment uh, will be done before and during the implementation and it's not, it's important to, uh, to recognize that it's not a validation a certification process and is mainly based also on self-assessment. So um, we, we give the advice and how do we give it? The, the depth of the quality of the advice will uh, depend on the quality of the information provided um, yeah, by the project holder about the project. And the comments uh, that we give uh, will address the merit, the relevance of the project, the outcomes and expected impact, impacts, the proposed methods, and the promost, proposed analysis to quantify them. So th our approach has been validated and tested, and yeah, and we are about uh, we would like to mainstream this in existing certification schemes. So the assessment uh, framework, the assessment is based uh, on the sustainable development goals. We have direct targets uh, in terms of um, SDG 2 for zero hunger, 15 life on land, 13 the climate actions. Indirect targets is the SDG 6, the clean water and uh, sanitation and 12 responsible consumption and production. And um, we have also safe, uh, safeguard targets in terms of uh, human rights, land ten tenure, and poverty alleviation. The, uh, we have uh, for the project assessment uh, four uh, sequential steps that will be uh, followed uh, in order to evaluate a project. The step one is the safeguard cr criteria and we uh, assess if the project compromises human rights, land rights, or poverty alleviation. Uh, we have uh, in the second, uh, this uh, criteria need, uh, the project need to meet all of these first criteria. The second, st in the second step, uh, uh, as well, if, the, if the project does not meet this criteria, then it will directly uh, not, uh, not further evaluated, will not be further evaluated. When it meets the uh, safeguard criteria, then the project undergoes uh, an assessment about the direct reference criteria. Uh, we will test if the uh, uh, project has a positive uh, effect uh, on soil organic carbon and does not compromise the others, for example, climate change adaptation, climate change uh, mitigation and uh, food, food security. Uh, then in a third step, they will be evaluated if the uh, project has uh, beneficial effects on welfare and well-being, biodiversity and in ecosystem services and water and nutrient cycles. And also we will look if the project uh, meets cross-cutting criteria in terms of uh, training and capacity building and participatory uh, and socially inclusive approaches. So um, when the, after the end of the assessment, we will provide narrative advice aiming at improving the quality uh, of the project before and during the implementation. 
And this is uh, advice is intended to be provided to the project holder so that the project holder can improve uh, his projects in order to obtain funding from uh, funding sources. We, we do not distribute uh, money, and we, we do, uh, have not any funding available, but we can provide uh, advice in order that uh, projects can be improved to get funding from other sources. So we also um, have actions to promote scientific policy interactions. Um, in 2017, at the COP23 of the UNFCCC, um, the, the, there was a landmark decision at the climate conference which acknowledged uh, acknowledges the importance of agriculture and food security in the climate change agenda. This was really um, yeah, very new because uh, UNFCCC recognized the role of agriculture in tackling climate change. This is, was the first time, has uh, never been happened before. And the countries agreed to work together to make sure that agricultural development ensures both increased food security in the face of climate change and a reduction of emissions. So the uh, UNFCCC uh, established Coronivia workshops, joint work uh, on agriculture, um, where the, the parties will discuss, uh, uh, will, will, will be informed and uh, discuss actions that could be taken. And um, yeah, uh, uh, there will be a consultation to enhance the NDC ambition uh, for solar organic carbon protection and sequestration, um, where we participated. And also we make joint submissions um, uh, uh, with, together with ITPS, GSP, SPI, and UNCCD, and others to highlight the role of uh, solar organic carbon. So um, we provide scientific, scientific uh, evidence in order to raise ambition and to support actions on uh, NDCs, as national determined contributions for increasing or maintaining soil carbon. So we think that's important that the, uh, that the countries consider soil organic carbon as one possibility to, uh, yeah, to make, to include them in the national determined contributions. Um, also, we uh, had some actions to define research priority. At least we developed a research program with uh, four pillars, estimating the solar organic carbon storage potential, developing management practices, define, uh, uh, some research actions are needed about the defining and enabling environment, and also uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification need to be improved and is uh, really important to consider in research. And uh, the identification of these research priorities was done in synergy with the Sulkaja project. Um, and the objectives are to strengthen the international research community on agricultural soil organic carbon sequestration, to provide an improved understanding of agricultural soil organic carbon and its potential for climate change mitigation and adaptation and for demands of increased food production. And um, yeah, the, the third objective was to synthesize the stakeholder views and knowledge needs on agricultural soil organic carbon sequestration and climate change, and uh, uh, to favor a more structured approach by preparing an international research uh, consortium. Um, Then, uh, how can we achieve future progress? The STC um, uh, suggested some actions that need to, to be done in order to achieve, uh, to, to achieve soil organic carbon sequestration under four per mil. So first of all, we should stop soil organic carbon losses. We should apply uh, known sustainable practices, develop new, new practices and technologies to monitor, report, and verify we should test strategies, uh, raise awareness, provide support, and coordinate policies. And uh, the most important thing uh, in order to implement the, uh, the four per mil initiative is the multi-stakeholder collaboration. So we need uh, research to identify improved uh, soil management, um, which need to be uh, yeah, uh, implemented by the landowners 
And in order to support uh, financially landowners as well as the research, we need the businesses and we need the governments in order to set, uh, set the framework. And so we really need this multi-stakeholder collaboration and therefore the, the four per mill initiative is a multi-stakeholder platform where all these actors come together and uh, discuss and work together. So we promoted interactions uh, with finance. For example, um, we, uh, we organized uh, in collaboration with others uh, an, uh, a webinar, uh, an MRV and finance for soil carbon webinar this year uh, in April. So it's, it was recorded and you can um, listen to it at uh, the web page. Uh, the title was Enhancing Investment in Soil Health and uh, Carbon Storage, Frontiers for Linking Finance and Carbon Accounting, was organized by CCAF, the Nature Conservancy, the Forper Mill World Bank and the Meridian Institute, uh, with the purpose to support investment oriented actions, promoting soil health and uh, carbon storage by improving the accounting of soil carbon sequestration. And uh, the webinar was designed to answer a simple question, how can soil uh, carbon, sequest, uh, so, uh, carbon accounting improve to support investment oriented actions promoting soil health and carbon storage? So the webinar had um, a lot of uh, success, there were a thousand participants registered. So in conclusion, the nowadays the scientists need to step out of the laboratory and engage with society and to provide the basis for policy decisions that should as the policy decisions should be based on best available scientific evidence and therefore the scientists yeah, need to uh, help to find the solutions to the to the big challenges that we have yeah, in, in nowadays. So the SCC provides scientific advice for the definition of the vision, mission and implementation of the Forpomenil initiative. The SCC sets the scene in providing assessment criteria and indicators for soil carbon sequestration projects. And to develop further, the SCC promotes and works uh, on the engagement of the initiative with businesses uh, governments, private organization, and helps, uh, helps to provide uh, to exploit funding possibilities. So I would like to acknowledge Paul Lu and uh, the Executive Secretariat for providing advice and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Cornelia, for this presentation of the work of the Technical Scientific Committee. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce our next guest, Claire Chenu. Uh, Claire is a research director at INRAE, French National Research uh, Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. She's also consulting professor of soil sciences at AgroParisTech. Uh, Claire will give a presentation on the importance and role of soil of organic carbon in soil uh, the mitigation of climate change. Thank you very much, Claire, for joining us today. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, it's okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Hola, buenas, uh, buenos dias a todos. It's a pleasure to present, to talk to you about the role and importance of soil organic carbon for soil health and climate change mitigation. So soil health, as you likely know, is the continued capacity of soils to support ecosystem services. And there was a recent uh, action at the European level uh, regarding that. And you know that soils provide many ecosystem services and soil organic matter, which I like to represent always in interaction with the soil biota, contribute to these ecosystem services. Soil organic matter, Whole, um, provisions nutrients, provisions water, provides a good structure, uh, provides beneficial, helps to have beneficial organisms so that it sustains soil fertility and sustains the ecosystem service of provision of food, of material, of fibers. It is, it contributes to making soil a good habitat for organisms and is it's trophic the trophic resource for organisms, so contributes to uh, the supporting service for soil biodiversity. 
soil is a key is key in the cycling of elements and then in the recycling of nutrients, but also on the fate of organic wastes. It also contributes to the regulation of the uh, water cycle and water quality. Through its role on soil structure, soil organic matter contributes to the regulation of erosion and extreme associated events, as it contributes to soil, as it uh, contributes to soil characteristics. It doesn't. It is involved in well our landscape or natural heritage related to soils, and again because it is um, key to uh, central to the, the cycle of elements, it is involved in the, the regulation of greenhouse gases and in the regulation then of climate change. So soil organic matter in interaction with soil biota is absolutely uh, key, absolutely central to soil health, to ecosystem services. And to give you one quantitative example, this is a meta-analysis that I took from a paper from China. I'm sorry that I didn't, uh, I do not have any from Latin America or the Caribbean. I would welcome if you know similar one to send it to me. And this shows you uh, relative yields in China as a function of soil organic carbon stocks in the X axis. And you see that they increased with soil organic carbon and then they plateaued. So organic matter contributes to food security. And the second, maybe the second graph is more original and important. It shows that the yield variation over years, so what is related to climate variability and climate change decreases with soil organic carbon stocks. Then soil organic matter contributes to adaptation to climate change. And this was introduced by Paul, uh, this uh, key importance of soil organic matter in uh, towards food security, adaptation to climate change. And I will not introduce it again to mitigation of climate change. Yet, um, so today I'm talking about Soil organic carbon, soil organic matter, using the two terms, because you very likely know that soil organic carbon is the main component of soil organic uh, matter. So when you, you deal with functions, you're more interested, you better use the, rather use the terms uh, soil organic matter. This is the carbon cycle at the local cycle. So um, at the local scale, excuse me. So variations in the soil organic carbon or soil organic matter stocks will depend on the inputs to soil, um, especially related to primary production, but also on the outputs from soil, either losses by erosion or losses by, by degradation and mineralization. And you know that there's um, the carbon um, resides a certain time Right, but a certain time in soils before between the input and before uh, leaving it as CO2 or as eroded uh, carbon. One question that comes quite often, especially when discussing with practitioners is what should we do with the organic matter? Should we try to sequester it? Nothing moves, it stays there? Or should we try to um, have it mineralized? Because many functions depends on the mineralization of the organic matter. So this is a trade-off that very often comes uh, when discussing soil health, soil organic carbon, and uh, climate change mitigation. And so you, on the one hand, you have properties, functions, for which you would like to store soil organic matter for a long time, to sequester it, available water, cation exchange capacity, increase aggregate stability, and of course, um, storage for climate change uh, mitigation. On the other hand, you would like organic matter to be decomposed and decompose fast to sustain biodiversity, to pro sustain biological activity for its contribution to aggregate stability and to provide nutrients. So how to deal with this trade-off? But in fact, both are compatible. And I think it's very important to reconcile uh, soil health and climate change mitigation because, well, the, the pools of soil organic matter and soil organic carbon that tend to reside for decades or centuries in soils will be the ones more important for the functions that I are outlined in uh, orange, while the pools that turn over fast are more important for sustaining biodiversity and providing nutrients. So both are compatible. You can achieve both, provided that you fuel constantly the cycle by bringing in more inputs to soil. 
Now let's go back to the objectives that were presented both by Paul Liu and by Cornelia. So the, um, the idea is to first to protect the existing stocks. And I put you two illustrations. One on the left is the global soil carbon map that was um, provided, that was resulted from a bottom-up exercise managed by uh, FAO. And on the right, you have an example from the literature. It comes from Rwanda. It is carbon stocks in different land uses. And it's quite representative of how carbon stocks in different land uses um, classify it one to each other in different continents, different climates, even though the values are not the same. So protect the existing stocks. Protect the existing stocks where they are high. High latitudes, permanent uh, um, natural forests, um, peatland. Uh, at the scale of the globe, as well as the scale of the landscape or a country. And this is by avoiding to drain peatland. I don't think it's very, a very frequent uh, question that comes in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, or uh, by um, avoiding to uh, deforestation, which is more important. And the other, so for some areas of the world, this is the priority. For others, stocks are very low. And it's the case in certain areas of the world, and you have them also in your continent. And it's also the case more in general with annual crops. So here the priority is to increase soil organic carbon stocks. So you see differentiated objectives depending on the status, the land use, the region of the world. Now, if we think about increasing soil organic carbon stocks, so the second objective, I would like to Yes, bring you, um, present you a few statements and these could be discussed afterwards. Uh, let's consider a theoretical situation where we have a given management option, management A, and these organic carbon stocks are slowly declining close to equilibrium. Now let's implement a management option. Well, for example, Paul Liu uh, talked about agroforestry. It will, that, is able, allows to store more carbon in soil, uh, the stocks will increase and then at some stage will plateau, a new equilibrium is reached. The carbon storage potential is the difference between the baseline and this new carbon stock at a given, after a given period uh, and for a given uh, depth of soil. And different manage management options might lead to different equilibrium. Well, you can have different trees, for example, or different densities of trees if we talk about agroforestry. Now, one thing that you may uh, look is uh, look at the numbers on the X axis, the time uh, storage is very slow. So this is indeed a problem in terms of policy. It's a, it's a problem in terms of incentives. If you stop the agroforestry, you cut the trees, you're going to go back to the initial equilibrium, to the initial trend. So carbon storage is reversible. So it's very important to maintain in time the management options that allow to store more carbon or to protect carbon. And in addition, if your initial land use was a forest and you deforest, well, the loss of carbon is rapid and huge. So again, the priority is to protect the existing stocks. So the carbon storage potential of a soil, which is something that we need in initiatives such as the four per mill initiative, it is really an important uh, variable. It is the maximum gain in carbon that is reachable for a given timeline under a given land use and management, and it depends on climate and soil type. Now, I would like to go back to the initial idea, which is to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Well. There's, there are situations where you can increase locally the stocks of carbon, but you do not sequester. Uh, take the example of a certain amount of manure that you would have. If you place it, if you apply it to different crops, your given amount of manure, you, may, you will increase carbon stocks where you apply the manure, but you will not change anything in terms of um, pumping CO2 from the atmosphere. So the soil organic carbon sequestration is the carbon storage in soils that allow for a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere for a long duration. So it's more restrictive than carbon storage. And this needs to be, this is the goal um, when dealing with climate change issues. 
Now, how to do it? How to do it? Let's go back for agroecosystems to uh, the graph I already showed you with the carbon cycle at the local level. Well, there are different levers of action. Increased primary production through cover crops, through uh, grassing, um, the intervals in vineyards and orchards, through increasing the duration of temporary grasslands, through implementing agroforestry, you increase the biomass, stopping to lose carbon via fires, increasing the returns of biomass to, to soils by increasing the returns of crop residues to soil, adding exogenous organic matter resources, manure, compost, for example. So all these increases the inputs to this organic matter and so organic carbon pool. Now you can try also other levers are to try to decrease the outputs, for example, by protecting soil from erosion with terracing, with agroforestry, with no tillage and conservation agriculture, for example, and try reducing biodegradation and mineralization uh, by minimizing uh, soil uh, tillage. So there are different levers that have different performance in quantitative terms, uh, given the pedo pedologic context between the, depending on the pedoclimatic context. And there's a lot of work ongoing and that has been done also to evaluate uh, the carbon storage potential with these different management uh, options. Now, if we go to a wider, uh, larger scale, uh, so the question is, okay, how much can be stored? Um, if we look for what I would name, uh, we would name a biophysical potential, it has been uh, quite brilliantly shown that there's a huge carbon debt of human land use uh, since um, 12,000 years. You have that on this graph on, on the left, that uh, while the area of land that was uh, devoted to grazing land and to cropland increased in our human history, the amount of so organic carbon loss that uh, has been estimated increased. So there's a huge, we can may assume that the biophysical potential is returning to these initial land uses. And as you may observe on the right, these, uh, well, the occupation, the present occupation of crop and grazing, of course, is heterogeneous across the world. And the hotspots of carbon losses uh, through throughout uh, human history are heterogeneous, but well, the hotspots are in red. Well, Europe appears very red because we have a very long history of agriculture. So this is, in a sense, the biophysical potential that could be attained. Now, there has been, so I told you that they, they are ongoing and there has been quite many estimates and we need more estimates of the carbon sequestration and carbon storage potential at the local scale with different management options. Now, there have been, there have been and there still are, it's a very active field of research, estimates at the global scale. And um, so here take estimates of the biophysical or technical potential, what can be implemented to increase salt carbon uh, through data compilations, through meta-analysis. There's large uncertainty and it's, it's normal that there's large uncertainty that the numbers that you can see uh, that I, I took from different um, publications, you see it goes well with the number that Cornelia uh, gave you about one gigaton of carbon per year. That seems achievable in terms of additional soil carbon uh, sequestration in soils of the world. And this is about one fourth of the amount of carbon that goes yearly from uh, our planet to the atmosphere. So it's not the magic bullet doesn't solve the, the problem, but it is a very, potentially a very important contribution. So it really deserves to pay, at, to be paid attention like we do in the Four Per Mill initiative. So carbon sequestration, carbon storage potential need to be estimated. So I talked about biophysical potential, but the land use on a given climate and soil that can result in the highest observed, observable uh, stocks. We can talk about technical potential. What are the management options that in biophysical terms or because of the history of the production system can be implemented? You cannot implement agroforestry or cover crops everywhere. But it, this has a cost. This has a cost. 
And uh, both Paul and Cornelia insisted on that we need uh, multi-stakeholders approaches, we need multidisciplinary approaches because it has cost and then the economical potential needs to be estimated. And, uh, and it is it, in the few cases where it has been estimated, well, it has been estimated recently for France in, um, in a study coordinated by ENRI, uh, it is lower than the technical potential. And what in most cases remains to be estimated, there are very little studies, is what is achievable if you consider also the uh, enabling conditions, the acceptance, the acceptability of these practices. So there's a strong need to estimate carbon storage potential, these different carbon storage potential. Uh, as I said, there has been a few attempts. There has been one in France. There is uh, one that is just starting at the scale of Europe of different uh, European countries within the um, framework of a European uh, joint program. And with this European joint program, we would like to um, organize um, international calls also dedicated to that. Carbon storage, but there are trade-offs. And uh, Cornelia talked about the trade-offs, trade-offs and uh, risks and limits. There are in particular trade-offs between soil organic carbon sequestration and climate change mitigation, because the dynamics of soil organic matter may result in the emission of, I talked about CO2, but also other greenhouse gases, uh, methane and N2O in specific conditions. So what is, the balance between carbon sequestration and N2O emissions. I would like to present you the results of a recent meta-analysis that compared, well, investigated for studies, comparing additional soil organic carbon storage, additional N2O emissions when implementing management options. And management options considered here are agroforestry, cover crops, no tillage, and organic amendment. Carbon sequestration is in red, negative, we, uh, it's pumping carbon from the atmosphere, and it's all expressed in CO2 equivalent. And N2 emissions is expressed also in CO2 equivalent, but as an emission, and it's in green here. Well, you can see that you cannot, you have to pay attention to N2 emissions. It's very important, and it can uh, partly offset the effect of carbon sequestration. But in most cases, it does not uh, override the effect of soil carbon sequestration. It decreases the effect on climate change mitigation, but does not eliminate it and does not uh, go to the dark side, I would say. Okay, so very important to assess and manage these trade-offs. Now, I would like to conclude um, that soil organic matter, soil carbon is key to address, are key to address um, soil health and climate change issues. So as it was, uh, presented by Cornelia, and I, as I hope that my um, talk also uh, supports, is that there are needs of more knowledge. There's needs for assembling knowledge. There are needs for making knowledge available to end users about evaluating the benefits of soil organic carbon and soil organic matter, or quantitative tools that allow quantitative evaluations. Needs to quantifying the effects of different sustainable soil management options and to evaluate soil organic carbon storage potentials. Needs to develop uh, accurate and reliable measuring, reporting, and verifying systems. Need to understand and to promote the enabling conditions for soil organic carbon uh, sequestration. And I would like you to keep as messages that preserving and increasing soil organic carbon brings multiple benefits in terms of soil health, in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigation, that increasing soil carbon in agricultural soils is feasible, but it is heterogeneous in terms of potentials, of constraints, of benefits. So the approach has to be spatially differentiated. Trade-offs need to be assessed so that they could be managed. And there's not a single good practice. There's no magic recipe, but an adequate combination of agroecological and sustainable management option in a given context. And this puts really farmers at the center as stewards of soil health and climate change mitigation. And for this conclusion, I would like to thank you. So, muchas gracias por su atención. Obrigado pela su atención. 
Thank you very much, Claire, for this interesting uh, presentation. I think we always learn something new with uh, this type of uh, presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, our Thank next you. guest is uh, Yeda Mendes. Um, Yeda, she's a scientific researcher at the Brazilian Corporation for Agricultural Research in Brapa Cerrados. Yeda has an important experience in agronomy with emphasis on soil biotechnology. Thank you very much, Yeda, for being here today uh, with us, uh, and you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, boa tarde, buenas tardes, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity of being here. And I also would like to thank uh, Beata, Dr. Beata Madari for have invited me to talk about soil bioanalysis, soil bio, which is this simple and effective tool that we have developed here in Brazil for on-farm soil health assessments. Well, the soil bioanalysis, te the soil bioanalysis technology involves selected bioindicators with well-defined critical levels that will help farm farmers to monitor soil health, knowing exactly what to measure, how to measure, when to measure, and most importantly, how to interpret what's being measured. Since July 2020, we are living this new moment here in Brazil, where we have uh, the presence of two soil enzymes, beta-glucose days from the carbon cycle and every sulfatase from the sulfur cycle in our routine soil analysis. So for the first time ever, Brazilian farmers now will be able to assess how is the biological functioning of their soils. And in Brapa, in a pioneer initiative, has capacitated nine commercial soil labs to perform enzyme determination in the context of the soil bioanalysis technology. The choice of beta glucosidase in aryl came after 20 years of research in our Brazilian Cerrado oxysols. The list of advantages of using these two soil enzymes uh, have to do with their sensitivity to changes in soil and crop management systems, to the fact that they are related to soil functioning, they are interpretable. We can, we, can, uh, we can know exactly when the soil enzymes levels are adequate, moderate, and low in our soils. Soil enzymes are correlated with all the microbe indicators of soil quality. Uh, they are precise, coherent, simple. The analytical procedures are inexpensive. And also, they can be performed directly in air-dried soil samples. Another, another important advantage is that these two soil enzymes, beta-glucosidase and aryl-sulfatase, in long-term field experiments, they have shown a strong and a robust relationship with crop yields, cumulative grain yields, and also with soil organic matter, which is very, very important uh, regarding economic aspects, obviously, grain yield, and also environmental aspects, because uh, soil organic matter is the best indicator of soil quality that we have. Uh, in terms of how to evaluate, soil sample is similar to soil chemical analysis. The only difference is that we must collect soil samples at the 0 to 10 centimeters soil depth. When to evaluate at post-harvest, coinciding with soil sample for chemistry, and also at the commercial soil labs, the, samples, the soil samples for bioanalysis, they can also be air-dried in the same way that the soil samples for soil chemistry. And the unification of this process of soil sampling and soil handling procedures at the lab, at the commercial labs, that we are called here in Brazil, the fat bio concept. So same soil sample for fertility, chemical analysis, and for biological analysis. And in order to interpret individual values of these soil enzymes, we have developed a strategy based on the same principles applied to soil nutrients calibration. So basically, in long-term field experiments, with and without application of phosphate fertilizers, we were able to establish response curves of soil enzymes as a function of cumulative grain yield in these long-term field experiments, cumulative grain yields of corn and soybeans. And, and, and based on these relations, we were able to set up critical levels. So soil enzymes levels to reach 8% of maximum grain yield were considered adequate. Soil enzymes level to reach 40% of the maximum cumulative grain yield were considered low. And the values in between were considered moderate. So using this strategy, we developed now uh, interpretative algorithms to estimate enzymes reference levels as a function of K-content. And now we have these algorithms, these interpretative algorithms specific for annual crops in the Cerrado biome. Uh, another very important component of the soil bioanalysis technology was what we call here the soil quality interpretation module. 
This is a web platform, a web interface that connects the commercial soil labs to our uh, computer service here at Embrapa. So by using this platform, we can automatically interpret the enzymes measurements made from the commercial laboratories. And at the same time, we can also calculate soil quality indexes. Uh, that, just to give you an idea about the conceptual model for the soil quality indices that we are working here in the soil bioanalysis, mm -hmm. uh, these soil quality indexes, they integrate chemical and biological indicators in three soil functions, nutrient cycling, nutrient storage, and nutrient supply. Nutrient cycle is based on the activity of the, of the two enzymes, beta glucosidase and adiosulfatase. Nutrient storage is associated with soil organic matter and the cation exchange capacity. And nutrient supply is associated with the acidic components, base supply, and fossil supply. So all three soil functions are, are integrated in soil quality index, biological and chemical. And then at the, at the end, we have this fertile soil quality index, which integrates the biological and the chemical components. It's important to say that all the soil quality index and all the scores of the of these soil functions they range between zero and one. The closer to one, the better. Here is a picture of these long-term field experiments with and without phosphate fertilization, where you used to test all these ideas regarding interpretation of microbial indicators and the calibration of the soil quality index. So basically, in the areas where we have fossil replication, we have high yield. With high yield, we have high crop residues entering the system. With time, we are talking here about, about more, more than 20 years of experimentation. We have so high soil organic matter, high soil organic matter, high soil quality, and the opposite in the areas where we don't have phosphorus uh, application. So in the same way that we did to interpret the individual values of enzyme measurements, we also established a curve response in these long-term field experiments. And in this way, we could calibrate all our soil quality index as a function of grain yield, cumulative grain yield of these long-term field experiments, and also soil organic matter. So again, uh, the soil quality index necessary to reach 8% of maximum grain yield was considered adequate. The soil quality index necessary to reach 40% of maximum grain yield was considered low, whereas in between, moderate. And then we, we are using this five color scheme, which remembers like a traffic light, which and it ranges from uh, red, orange, yellow, light green, and dark green, which are related to very low, low, moderate, high, and very high. In this way, we have uh, see if, if the scores range from moderate and very low, you see that you have major soil health constraints. In, of course, there are places for improvements in terms of your management decisions. And if your scores of, this, of your soil functions, of your soil quality index, they range between very and very high, very high and high, uh, it, they suggest that there is a sense of soil health constraints. Well, from now on, I'm showing you some of the results that we have obtained using soil bioanalysis in Brazilian farms. And it's important to say that all the results that I will show from now on were obtained by commercial soil laboratories, okay? The first kind of soil, bio, of soil bioanalysis report, report type number one, is interesting because it has high enzymes and high soil organic matter. So it's a situation, it's like the, the, the dream situation, right? The, the perfect situation. No problems in nutrient cycling, no problems in nutrient storage. Uh, here is how the soil bioanalysis report looks like. Every line corresponds to a place in the farm. And in the columns, we have the enzyme activities, aryosulfatase, beta glucosidase, and then soil organic matter. And then we have all, all the soil quality index, the fertibio, the biological, and the chemical. And then we have the scores of the three soil functions, nutrient cycling, nutrient storage, and nutrient supply. This first bio report is from a farm called Planato Farm. It's, it's one of the biggest farms in Brazil, 17,000 hectares in Mato Grosso. And it's a very interesting situation because here we have high yield and soil quality. For you have an idea, soybean grain yields in, in this area are greater than five tons per hectare. And, and when we look at the soil bio report, we see that most part of the areas are punctuating in the high, in the dark green and light green, okay? So it's a win-win situation where we have high yield and soil quality. And here's another kind of soil bio report type one. Everybody's chemically and biologically excellent, no problems at all. But then it comes soil bio report type two. And here we start having problems because see, in this case, some enzymes are low, 
but soil organic matter is still punctuating in the high and very high levels. It is like the farmer has a bomb in its farm. Why? Because soil enzymes are more sensitive than soil organic matter to detect early changes that occur in the soil as a function of the, of the management systems. So here we have a situation where although soil organic matter has not yet been affected, there is a clear decline from the biological perspective. Enzymes, in this case, they act as bad news early warning indicators. Some examples, here we have a farm from Mato Grosso, a 60% a clay oxy soil, a region with enough precipitation, 2,000 millimeters, perfect. But then, when you go and you look at the soil bioanalysis, you see that the nutrient supply function is great, nutrient storage perfect, but then it comes to soil enzymes, which reflect the biological functioning of your soils, compromised. So in, this is a new vision that goes, a new vision of your soil that goes far beyond simply a question of deficiency or excess of nutrients, okay? So this is the great advantage of working with the soil bioanalysis. Uh, again, this is another type of soil bio report type two. And soil bio report type, type three is like, is a situation, is the, the, worst case, the worst case situation, okay? Soil enzymes are low, soil organic matter is low, nutrient cycling and nutrient storage totally compromised. In this case, soil organic matter decline is coupled with biological decline. Soil health is in a critical condition. It's like the bomb has exploded, okay? Terrible. And here's some examples. Uh, this is a farm, again, from Mato Grosso, clay oxy soil, 72%, 72% clay content, 1,800 millimeters precipitation. But then when you go and look at, at the scores of the nutrient supply function, perfect, no problem. But then when, when it comes to nutrient storage and nutrient cycling, you see that the system is all compromised, okay? In, in this case, soil organic matter even is compromised, which is really, really bad because we don't want lost carbon. We want to, to sequester carbon, we have to increase our carbon. Another kind of, of soil by report type three, is this time in miniaturized. And finally, we come to the type four soil bioanalysis report which is a situation where we see that there is hope. In this case, soil enzymes are high and soil organic matter, the nutrient storage uh, function is low. What happens here is that again, as soil, as soil enzymes are more sensitive than soil organic matter, they act as good news early warning indicators, showing us that the system, although soil organic matter has been seriously compromised, the system is recovering from the biological perspective. This is a farm, a small farm in Goiás State. Uh, and here we can see that uh, the, the scores of the F2 functions, nutrient storage, are really the worst part, red, uh, orange, yellow. But then when it comes to nutrient cycling, they are of most part is green, light green, dark green, which shows that this, this case is very interesting. This farm, the owner, this is a lady, uh, she bought the farm two years ago and the soils were really degraded. Here we are talking about, about a 42% clay oxy soil. And the organic matter in this, in this condition should be above 3%. And she notes that the soil organic matter contents, walking black, were less than 2%, sometimes even 1%. So the farm was really degraded in a very poor situation. And since she bought the farm about two years ago, she has started a, a soil management based on the, on the use of deep rooted grasses, such as brachiaria, with a annual input of dry matter above 50 tons per hectare. So within these two years, she, although the soil gain matter content hasn't changed because it will take a while, as we all know, the soil enzymes are giving indication that she's in the, in the right way. She's, she's doing, uh, she's in the, she's, she, she, will, she will reach that, she, she's improving uh, her, her, her soil. So she's, she's showing that uh, it is, this kind of result is important for farmers to know whether their management practices are really improving soil health, it motivates farmers to keep going on that way. Well, uh, this, this soil technology was launched in July, and since then we are, we are having, we are creating this soil health data bank in Brazil. So far, we have 1,600 soil samples from farms all over the Cerrado region. And based on these first 16 soil samples, we are building what we are calling the Brazilian Embryonic Soil Health Scoreboard. So by looking at the percent distribution of soil samples in the soil bioanalysis classes, in for each of, for, for the three soil functions, nutrient supply, nutrient storage, and nutrient cycling, we can see that 86% of the 
soil samples so far analyzed in, in present in our bank, 86% they are, are punctuating high and very high in terms of nutrient supply, 67% uh, for nutrient storage, high and very high, and 57% for nutrient cycling, uh, uh, are punctuating by high and very high. And this is not bad at all. This is not bad because this is the first time that our farmers have the possibility, have the, the access to this kind of information. So we hope that from now on, as long as they have better glucose days and are use days as part of their routine soil analysis, they, this, they, this kind of information, we, we, were, we were able to guide them in terms of management decisions so that in the near future, instead of having only 57% of our farms in this situation, we want to have 100% of our farms in this situation. And we want to make an agriculture in health soils. Well, as final remarks, I would like to say that the inclusion of, of these interpretable soil enzymes in routine soil analysis is very important for farmers to assess whether their management practices are improving, conserving or degrading soil soils, of degrading soil resources, because before, before soil analysis, they didn't know how, how to know about that. And now they have this kind of, this, this, this opportunity. In its present stage, soil bioanalysis is defined only for annual crops in the Cerrado biome, for all kinds of, uh, for all soil types in, soil, in the Cerrado biome, from sandy soils to clay soils. And we are talking about 35 million hectares, and it's quite simple, practical, and scalable. And currently, we have eight commercial soil labs using soil enzymes and assessing the soil quality interpretation module of Embrapa. And in the next phase, we already have more than 50 soil labs, commercial soil labs, that will, will be included in this project. And in the near future, soil bioanalysis also will include sugar cane, coffee, pastures, and eucalyptus. This is a picture of my of the of the bioindicators project team. Many people all, all over these 20 past years. And muito obrigada, muitas graças, and thank you for your attention. It was very nice being here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ieda, for the great presentation. And now uh, our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Ma. Uh, he's representing. Uh, he's, um, he represents a very important stakeholder group of the Four Formula Initiative. Uh, Senor Ma is Vice President of Cotreal Farmers Cooperative, President of the Brazilian Federation of Notillage and Irrigation, and also of the Confederation of the American Associations for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, the screen is with you, please. Okay, thank you, man. Thanks, Giata. Thanks for the hundred twenties. And uh, uh, I would like to speak in Portuguese because, in behalf of our friends from from South America, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, many of them are uh, are sitting us now in this presentation. So many thanks for the invitation again. Bem, eh, eu agradeço mais uma vez esse convite e falar sobre o sistema uh, da agricultura do Brasil, uh, o papel dos agricultores e suas organizações na América do Sul, e principalmente Argentina, Paraguai, Uruguai e Brasil, né, é realmente algo muito gratificante. Porque nós somos responsáveis, como produtores sul-americanos, por praticamente um quarto da produção mundial de grãos. Né, e temos aqui em nossos, em nossos países... É uma, um grande desafio de produzir alimentos com sustentabilidade. E o produtor, o papel do agricultor e suas organizações é muito, muito importante, porque nós, como produtores, estamos agregados em instituições confiáveis, fidedignas e realmente sérias para não apenas lutar pelo nosso trabalho, pelos nossos direitos, mas principalmente para mostrar ao mundo o que realmente nós fazemos. E o trabalho da Confederação das Associações Americanas para a Agricultura Sustentável, a CAPAS, é exatamente nesse sentido. Né? Nós somos uma grande, somos uma, uh, somos quatro países, basicamente, mas estamos abertos para outros países da América, do Sul, América Central, América do Norte, para juntos desenvolvermos uma agricultura verdadeiramente sustentável. E o sistema plantio direto, o Kirin, ele começou realmente algo há praticamente 50 anos atrás. 
é, quando pensávamos em agricultura, olhávamos, vimos essa situação, não é? exatamente com os efeitos contrários ao que nós esperamos, ouvindo todas essas palestras anteriores do Paulu, da Cornélia, da Claire, Chenu, da Ieda, mostrando como nós, como a agricultura no país realmente estava sendo prejudicada por nós importarmos uma tecnologia dos países é, é, de clima temperado, dos países do hemisfério norte, onde a aração do solo, o preparo do solo pesado por causa da neve, por causa do frio, né? tudo isso gerou uma situação que nos países tropicais, o mesmo subtropicais como a Argentina, nós podemos mitigar esses problemas por meio da adoção do sistema plantio direto. Então, a gente vê que tudo isso, essas, essas fotos mostram os efeitos das chuvas, o plantio na terra nua, os canais soreados, as represas, acúmulo de terras, enfim, os danos, os prejuízos provocados pela não adoção do sistema plantio direto, pela adoção do sistema convencional, que além de perdas diretas e econômicas, provocam tantas outras perdas em todo o meio ambiente, em toda a situação em que a população vive. É, eu até gostaria de falar um pouquinho sobre a população. Talvez vocês estranhem de eu, alguém de olhinho puxado, né, um oriental. É, eu sou de origem chinesa, nascido no Brasil, somos de família de agricultores e tenho o privilégio né, de presidir uma associação americana, mostrando que hoje a nossa nós não temos fronteiras e somos totalmente inclusivos. E, embora... Uh, e, o, e o Brasil é um país formado por migrantes né, de vários países do, do mundo. E a nossa família, que veio da China, se estabeleceu no país há 60 anos, estamos na agricultura há 60 anos, trabalhando e tra desenvolvendo essa agricultura maravilhosa. Então, o plantio direto, basicamente, há 50 anos atrás, foi introduzido aqui no Brasil, né, pelos pioneiros Ebert Bartz, Frank Dijkstra, uh, Nuno Pereira, não é? Então, foi realmente um trabalho muito grande ao longo de quase cinco décadas. Ano que vem, nós vamos completar cinco décadas de trabalho. E já quero aproveitar e convidar a todos vocês, convidar os amigos do 4 por mil os amigos do mundo que nos assistem. É, inclusive, nós vamos ter no ano que vem o oitavo Congresso Mundial de Agricultura Conservacionista. É, convidar os amigos da América para o nosso jubileu de ouro dos 50 anos do Sistema Plano Direto na América, no Brasil e nas Américas, na América do Sul principalmente. Vamos realizar esse evento em Foz do Iguaçu, né, na, tríplice, na região da Tríplice Fronteira, entre Brasil, Uruguai, Paraguai, Argentina, Brasil e Paraguai. E todos estão convidados para 2021 estarmos juntos, vermos como esses pioneiros lutaram e o que já geraram para o nosso Brasil e que se tornou hoje a maior instituição de agricultura sustentável. Então, os agricultores unem-se com a pesquisa, os agricultores unem-se com as instituições, com as empresas, para juntos trabalharmos. É, é muito importante destacar a importância dos produtores rurais, como bem destacou a doutora Ieda, a doutora Claire, uh, anteriores, como, é importante os, como são importantes os agricultores. E os agricultores, não isoladamente, mas trabalhando com foco, unidos por uma causa, inicialmente, que foi para mitigar os problemas da erosão, os problemas da, dos efeitos ambientais negativos, pela aração do solo, pela não do, pelo não uso do plantio direto, mas que, por meio do, dessa necessidade, formaram o Clube da Minhoca, Clube dos Amigos da Terra, não é? e que, em 92 tornou-se a Federação Brasileira de Plantio Direto, que hoje é a maior instituição de agricultura sustentável do Brasil e que, juntamente com a, as federações da Argentina, do Uruguai e Paraguai, constituem a Confederação Americana, das Associações Americanas. Muito bem. O trabalho nosso da Federação, e das federações, da CAPAS e da Federação Brasileira e demais instituições é defender o sistema de plantio direto. Nós vimos nas palestras anteriores, e inclusive na como um dos uh, tópicos principais do 4 por mil, como a importância, a importância do no tillage, a importância do sistema de plantio direto. O no tillage, zero tillage ou cultivo mínimo, mas muito mais do que isso. 
é um sistema de plantio direto. Não é meramente deixarmos de arar o solo, não é meramente aplicarmos um herbicida ou um, um agroquímico. Pelo contrário, é a redução desse, desse trabalho e é a redução de é, uso de equipamentos que permitam a gente conservar o solo da melhor forma possível, produzindo mais, gastando menos, preservando o ambiente. E mantendo esses três princípios fundamentais, não é? que é que são o mínimo recolhimento do solo, cobertura permanente do solo, que é importantíssimo para a sequência de carbono, resíduo de, de, de manejo de resíduos do solo, né? compostagem desses resíduos, não é? e temos também o uso de cultura de cobertura. Né? Tudo isso que a federação faz, que os produtores do Brasil fazem e da, da América pra, trabalham, são é, é algo realmente totalmente ligado às iniciativas de 4 por mil, de sequestro de carbono, de conservação de matéria orgânica, de incremento da matéria orgânica do solo, do carbono do solo. E nós vamos ter, consequentemente, ao invés de solos degradados como esse, vamos ter cultura de cobertura, vamos ter aqui, aqui a região de Foz do Iguaçu, se, hoje, se no ano que vem nos encontrarmos em Foz do Iguaçu, eu espero que vocês vejam essa situação e verão a situação, e não mais esta aqui, que era antes do sistema plantio direto. Milhões, bilhões de toneladas de terra eram carreadas aqui em Foz do Iguaçu, e hoje a situação é essa, graças principalmente ao trabalho do sistema plantio direto aqui no Brasil. Conserva a redução da temperatura do solo, né, um solo coberto, com 34 graus, um clima tropical como o nosso, e o plantio convencional, 63 graus Celsius. Então vejam a importância desse trabalho. E vejam rapidamente como a nossa agricultura cresceu no país. A agricultura cresceu no país, a produção agrícola do Brasil cresceu. Hoje o Brasil produz mais de 200 e quase 300 milhões de toneladas de grãos graças ao incremento do sistema plantio direto no Brasil. Sim, ocorreram muitos desmates que o mundo hoje condena e nós também condenamos. Mas eu quero falar uma, uma, algo muito importante. O Brasil vai continuar crescendo e se tornar, assim como as Américas, América do Sul, continuar crescendo a produção de alimentos sem ter que derrubar uma só árvore. Apenas trabalhando aumentando a produtividade, trabalhando em cima de pastagens degradadas, transformadas em áreas agricultáveis para a produção de grãos, ou mesmo áreas de pastagens degradadas, melhor trabalhadas, melhor desenvolvidas, para produzir mais uh, uh, proteína por metro quadrado, no pastejo, seja de animais de corte ou de animais de leite, outras atividades, o Brasil vai produzir muito mais e não precisa derrubar uma só árvore. Isso nós garantimos, porque temos um trabalho de consciência mental muito, muito grande. Hoje produzimos alimentos conservando o ambiente. E aqui está uma prova inquestionável de que o Brasil, ele hoje tem apenas é, 8% da sua área plantada em lavouras. E nas propriedades rurais temos 11% de vegetação nativa. E as demais áreas do Brasil são vegetação nativa em unidades de conservação, em terras indígenas, em terras devolutas ou relevos complicados. Não é? Aqui a área de cidades, estrutura tal. Aqui a área de pastagens. Então, podemos ver que a agricultura, que é tão condenada... A agricultura que nós realizamos no Brasil, às vezes é tão condenada, tão mal interpretada lá fora. Sim, ocorreram fatos que permitiram essa má interpretação, mas hoje somos responsáveis por conservar 11% da vegetação nativa do país. E nós vimos na apresentação do Paulo e dos demais como é importante, o que nós queremos é restaurarmos o máximo a floresta natural, o ecossistema natural e sistemas agroflorestais, agro-silvo-pastoril, integração de lavoura, pecuária com a floresta, 
é um trabalho que a federação desenvolve, na qual o sistema de direto está envolvido diretamente nesse, nessa questão de conservação do ambiente, produzindo mais, sem ter que abrir uma árvore a mais, derrubar uma árvore a mais, utilizando pastagens ou melhorando as áreas de lavoura. Então, nós temos grandes conquistas para mostrar para vocês que é a consolidação do plantio direto, sistema de direto nas principais culturas e a adequação das tecnologias ao, ao modelo atual e, principalmente, a cultura 4.0, a agricultura 5.0. Estamos viabilizando o sistema de produção de baixo impacto ambiental, econômico e ambiental. Queremos realmente produzir mais com menos e cada vez uh, sem impactos ambientais. O doutor Eder falou muito bem, é uma preocupação muito grande hoje nossa, essa integração da química, da física, biologia do sistema e a valorização do que nós produtores fazemos como plano, com o sistema plano direto pelos programas nacionais e mundiais de agricultura de baixo carbono. Isso é o nosso trabalho. A iniciativa 4 por mil, os programas de agricultura de baixo carbono estão totalmente alinhados com o nosso trabalho. Temos problemas ainda, principalmente nos, nas áreas tropicais da América, no Brasil propriamente, maior, algumas áreas do Paraguai e Argentina, produção de palhada, problemas ainda relacionados à alta dependência de insumos, o sistema do direto de gado limitado a grandes culturas, né? e limitação a diferentes culturas, como eh, culturas em outros países, né? países mais altos, ou países em áreas de, de, de cordilheiras, ou em culturas de arte cordilheira, ou culturas uh, agro, uh, de, menor, uh, de menores áreas, não é? e problemas hoje de custo de produção. Mas temos grandes desafios. Estamos tendo grandes conquistas em produção de palhada, em couve crops, em cultura de cobertura, né? e isso melhorando. E, e esse item, com a menor redução, com a maior, com, aumentando a redução, quer dizer, reduzindo, propriamente falando, o uso de agroquímicos por meio de um melhor manejo de pragas, de doenças, de panatizaninhas. Né? O Brasil hoje está produzindo produzir mais, gastando menos, não é? e culturas que pode, podem adotar como culturas perenes, citros, eucaliptos, cana-de-açúcar, HFs, hortifruti granjeiros, é? e algo que nós devemos pleitear e lutar que o mundo reconheça que o agricultor, não só brasileiro, mas o agricultor, é, que é realmente consciente, ele preserva o ambiente, ele está pagando do seu bolso para preservar o ambiente, e a federação tem um trabalho de mostrar isso ao mundo, que ele possa também ser remunerado, ou possa ser reconhecido, pelo menos, e ser pago pelos serviços ambientais que ele promove ao mundo. Então, hoje, na federação, trabalhamos no Brasil em 14 estados brasileiros, temos mais de 33 milhões de hectares de sistema de lanche direto no Brasil, né? trabalhamos uh, várias ações, acabamos de realizar edições do Encontro Nacional de Lanche Direto, capacitação de pessoas através de fóruns regionais, a multiplicação de informação por meio de, de newsletters, e temos índices desenvolvidos, né? como eu vou mostrar para vocês, e depois eu vou mostrar também dos países que nós trabalhamos um trabalho muito importante que trabalha, que desenvolvemos e mostramos ao mundo é mensurarmos, é monitorarmos o grande trabalho do sistema do direto eh, e de conservação do solo, de sequestro de carbono, conservação de palha. É, são índices que mostram esses aqui, intensidade de rotação de culturas, densidade de rotação de culturas, a persistência de palhada ou de resíduos no solo, a frequência de preparo no solo, o nível de terraceamento para conservação, como está a conservação do solo, como está também a fertilização do solo e o tempo de redução do sistema de lanche direto. Isso é um trabalho participativo. Trabalhamos mais de 800 fazendas no Brasil nesse último ano e temos e somos tecnicamente cientificamente bem fundamentados para atender essa realidade. E avaliamos essa pontuação, pontuamos nas fazendas, pontuamos e mostramos em que situação está o produtor rural. E eu gostaria também de compartilhar com vocês uma grande conquista que estamos em andamento, é, estamos, estou quase acabando, é que nós temos hoje no país, hoje, quatro grandes biomas principais, que é a Amazônia, a Caatinga, o Cerra, a, desculpe, a Amazônia, o Cerrado, 
a Mata Atlântica e o Pampa. Esses são os principais. Temos a Caatinga também no, no, no nosso Nordeste e temos o Pantanal aqui no Centro-Oeste, em um bioma, são um pouco menores. Mas estamos trabalhando para de um projeto junto com o Euroclima, um dos projetos mais elogiados, que foi aprovado agora no final de 2000, eh, foi aprovado agora nesse segundo semestre de 2020, onde nós vamos mostrar que, pelo sistema piloto de direto, nós realmente temos capacidade de recuperação da matéria orgânica do solo e podemos promover serviços ecossistêmicos para a nosso para o país para o nosso solo para o ambiente isso é muito importante podemos vamos mostrar o índice de qualidade participativa que as propriedades que trabalham nos tempos direto também como conservam e como uh, o, o solo e também na parte biológica dos indicadores biológicos olha doutora Ieda né parâmetros físicos biológico, indicadores de qualidade do solo, né, nesses quatro biomas, para compararmos o que o agricultor faz para que aquele gráfico seja diminuída a distância entre a nossa agricultura e a floresta natural da Amazônia, dos Cerrados, o bioma natural da Mata Atlântica e do Pampa. Então, esse é um projeto muito, muito fantástico, maravilhoso. A Argentina... Eu quero aproveitar e saudar os amigos Alejandro Petec, a Pilu, da Aprecide, Associação Argentina de Produtores de Sistema Directa, também uma associação com mais de 1.500 produtores, 11 milhões de hectares, um terço de superfície né, em sistema direto, também com vários, com, com congresso anual, 28 anos de trabalho, mais de milhares de participantes, um trabalho em módulos né, no campo, de pesquisas, de desenvolvimento, de certificações, né, de manejo de pragas, de aplicações, de ensaios, de network, de então um trabalho de, de, de teste de tecnologias, de, de é, muito muito exitoso na Argentina através da APRECID. Então, uma saudações aos amigos da Argentina. Temos também um trabalho fantástico com nossos amigos é, da do, do Paraguai, uma saudação especial então ao Martin, ao Luiz Cubidia, da pela Federação Paraguai de Sistema Directa, também com centenas de membros e que tem um trabalho também de encontros anuais de, 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 de sembra direta, de, de sistema pelo de direto, devido ao Covid, né, 2020 também, alguns reduziram, nós realizamos por meio de virtuais, mas sempre com capacitação, dias de campo, jornadas, viagem de estudos, publicações e importantes relações institucionais. E finalizando o trabalho de um país menor, porém não menos importante, mas um país com muita evidência, aproveita para saudar os nossos amigos Facundo, Miguel Carvajal, Luciana Tabala, Associação Uruguai de Siembra Directa, também com uh, jornadas mensais de palestras, capacitações, uh, viagens e eventos mostrando a importância do trabalho de semeadura direta como uma das mais importantes ferramentas de produção de alimentos, conservando o ambiente para produzir mais com menos e realmente trazer o sequestro de carbono, aumentar, né, trazer saúde ao solo, trazer qualidade de vida para a população que nós trabalhamos aqui na América do Sul e certamente para o mundo. Esta é, uma, é um resumo foi, foi difícil apresentar quatro países em 20 minutos, mas agradeço a atenção e que todos possam saber de que estamos aqui para, junto com o restante, o restante do mundo, junto com os demais países, na iniciativa 4 por mil, realmente trabalhar buscando um futuro melhor para o nosso mundo. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Jonathan, uh, excellent presentation. Um, as, I, as, I, as, as I told you at the beginning, uh, we would like to... We would like to know a little bit about your interest uh, in, uh, in this topic. So please uh, take the next two minutes uh, to answer this questionnaire, okay? It would help a lot for us to, to know what to, 
what topics to place in next seminars, what you are interested in. So please wait about two minutes and then uh, we continue to with the closing of this workshop. Yes, Beata, if I may. Yes, as, as you have uh, several possibility, you have to choose all the possibility for each question. Uh, I mean, for no, that you question, can... you can choose several ones. And then mm -hmm. after you can uh, submit at the end. When it's submit, it's okay, it's valid. We have already 17, 16 uh, members that already voted. So it's a multiple choice question, right, Paul? Yes. Okay. So we have uh, seven, 27, 30. Well, it's increased. We'll let you a little bit more time to fill that. Uh, we, we had, uh, Beata, you have seen that one person raise his hand. I don't know if you want to yes. put the floor. I don't, I don't know if we have time to for a question or... Maybe during the, during the, 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 the questionnaire, Monica Arias, would you like to uh, comment or make a question? Uh, Paul, is, can you unmute her? Yes. I, okay. She has the possibility to use the mic. Can she switch on the mic? She's supposed to be able to do so. Yeah, and the low um, left corner of the screen, you should be able to activate your microphone, Monica. Now, okay, well. You can write a question in the, in the Q&A question. That will be easier. Yeah. We will answer it later. Yeah. As we soon will have to wrap up the, uh, this event, uh, we will probably not be able to answer all the questions but please don't hesitate to leave your questions still and we will try to uh, answer them later, probably by email. So through the registration, we have your email addresses. So we have 55 answer. If some uh, want still to answer the question here, that would be good, but that's already a good number. Yeah. Okay, Beata, you can wrap up. We'll let the, okay. the poll open and you can wrap up. I will okay. close at the end of the seminar with you. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, all for the participation, especially the speakers for the very good, excellent presentations and uh, for all for the questions that will uh, certainly um, impersonate, uh, we will certainly um, raise discussions, uh, hopefully there is, there is discussion within the Latin American and, and the Caribbean uh, community of soil science. So we had some uh, quite technical com comments and questions, uh, including some, uh, including the importance of nitrogen and other nutrient inputs for soil carbon sequestration uh, and uh, similar ones. Unfortunately, right now we cannot answer this. This should be, I think these are very important technical questions and I think we should make opportunity for discussion on, uh, on regional levels uh, to, to find solutions, um, possibly um, possible solutions for tropical agroecosystems. Um, I would also like to thank uh, now for Professor Ricardo Ralis from the University of Londrina. He helped a lot to idealize this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank for the interpreters of uh, Lumen, 
And um, well, at last but not least, the, my colleagues from EMBRAPA and from the Secretariat of the Fort Formula Initiative to, for all the help and orientation that they gave uh, to successfully organize this webinar. And uh, I don't know if we can finish the, the poll, then I there is just one last thing that I would like to say, but for that, I would like to share my screen. Okay, it's finished. Okay, thank you. Um, This one. I hope you can see that. So I would like to announce a next event uh, in 2021, which will be also focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we organize it uh, together with different uh, several regional and international institutions and organizations. Uh, unfortunately, this is an event that we had to cancel earlier this year. So we hope that uh, next year in May, we can actually organize it. If it will be, if it can be an on-site event because of the COVID pandemics, maybe not, but if it can be an on-site event, it will be in Goiania, uh, in the Brazilian Savannah, the Cerrados region. Well, if not, then it will be another online event and we will focus, we would like to focus on the specific topics of interest of the region uh, using partly this questionnaire that you uh, filled in for us now. Uh, also uh, concentrating on some of the technical topics that arose, uh, that arose during, the, uh, during the webinar. And, Yes, so please, uh, we invite all of you. Um, we would be very happy if you could participate. And uh, well, to wrap up, I think, yes, we are exactly at the end of our time. I would like to thank you for all again for joining and um, well, have a nice rest of the day and happy holidays and an excellent new year. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Bye bye. And thank you for your participation. You. We were more than uh, 110 today. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye.